tonight on Elon Local News. President-elect Joe Biden begins his transition even without a projected winner here in North Carolina. Tonight, what you need to know about what ballots are left to be counted. Heading home early with Thanksgiving break two weeks away, why some Elon students are already traveling back home. And flying high, we'll take you up 15,000 feet for a breath of fresh air during this nonstop week. Those stories and more. Elon Local News starts right now. Live from the Jane and Brian Williams studio at Elon University School of Communications, you're watching Elon Local News. Good evening and thanks for joining us following a busy weekend. I'm Maeve Ashbrook. And I'm Brian Ray. We begin tonight with the latest election news. President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris are starting their transition to the White House, despite any word from President Trump since the Democratic ticket's projected win over the weekend. Today, the Biden-Harris transition team announced a coronavirus task force following the announcement from the pharmaceutical company Pfizer that its coronavirus vaccine is more than 90 percent effective. Biden says even with an effective vaccine, Americans need to continue wearing masks. The process must also be grounded in science and fully transparent so the American people can have every confidence that any approved vaccine is safe and effective. Meanwhile, President Trump has not spoken publicly since Thursday. Lawyers for the president continue to push forward lawsuits in several states alleging election irregularities. And President Trump continues his job firing Defense Secretary Mark Esper this afternoon. Elon students are still reacting to Biden's projected win and what the transition of power may look like. Um, I was surprised. Um, I thought Trump was going to win. I actually put some money down on it, um, but I'm happy. It feels like a sigh of relief for me, I think. I think America's going down the hole in the next 10 years, no matter what. I think that Biden can try to help unite the country a bit. I just, he's a little old. It worries <laughs> me. But other than that, I'm very happy. It was definitely closer than I thought it was going to be, but I'm not surprised. You know, a lot of the younger voters, you know, came out and showed, um, well, that we weren't kind of like messing around, you know, we came to play. Um, I think that we will finally have a more respectful and presidential person in office. And the first woman vice president. Especially knowing that Trump didn't, he, he's not taking his loss very well, so it's going to be like hectic. Meanwhile, North Carolina is one of three states that have yet to be called in the race for president. At this hour, President Trump remains ahead in the state with under 50 percent of the vote compared to Joe Biden, who has nearly 49 percent of the vote. North Carolina and the Alamance County Board of Elections are still counting votes at this hour ahead of a Friday deadline when all votes must be counted and verified. Now, there are two different types of votes still being counted across the state. The first are absentee ballots, which need to be postmarked by November 3rd and received by November 12th in order to count. According to the latest numbers from the State Board of Elections, nearly 95,000 absentee ballots still have to be counted. More than 998,000 already have been counted. Now, there are also provisional ballots, which are used when someone's voting eligibility is in question, which is later verified before the vote can count. There are more than 40,000 provisional ballots cast across the state in 868 right here in Alabama. County. Also tonight, it is still unclear who will represent North Carolina in the U.S. Senate. The race is between incumbent Republican Tom Tillis and Democrat Cal Cunningham. At this hour, Tillis remains ahead with nearly 49 percent of the vote compared to Cunningham's 47. Tonight, all eyes are on Georgia as the state has yet to finalize its pick for president with the two candidates separated by just over 10,000 votes. And two U.S. Senate races are moving to a runoff race, leaving some Elon students excited to have their national spotlight on their home state. Baylor Rodman has a story. With no candidate reaching 50 percent, Georgia state law moves two U.S. Senate races into a runoff, leaving the Peach State to determine the balance of power in Washington. One race is between incumbent Republican Senator David Perdue and Democrat nominee John Ossoff. Enough incompetence, yeah. deceit, corruption, division. Change has come to Georgia. This is what uh, this is all about in America. This is our number one privilege, the right to vote, right? Yeah. And I don't want some billionaires from California and New York coming down to Georgia and tell us how we ought to run this state. The second race is between Democrat Raphael Warnick and incumbent Republican Kelly Leffler, who was appointed to her seat following the resignation of Johnny Isaacson. The three of us are political outsiders. That's what Georgians need in Washington, fighters for the American dream. Thank you for pushing me one step closer to the Senate. Because when I get there, you will go with me. 
Atlanta native Elon Sr. Pearl Sullivan says she's excited to see this race be the signal to determine if Georgia will remain a swing state in the cycles to come. So I'm really hopeful that kind of the political engagement that led to Georgia going blue this year does continue because I think that is something that gives me a lot of hope for the future in terms of the U.S. just being a more politically engaged country overall. Elon Sr. Sarija Dutta says while she's not confident in Georgia's current leaders, she's optimistic about the future. Um, but it's nice to see that people are, are like kind of following the lead of these like bigger, more advanced cities through activists and politicians. And I think that regardless of what the results are in January, that this was a big move made for Georgia. Baylor Rodman, Elon Local News. Both runoff races in Georgia are scheduled for January 5th, just two weeks before Inauguration Day. The three Republicans who won seats on Alamance County's Board of Commissioners are preparing to get sworn in on December 7th. The commissioners oversee 38 departments as well as the annual budget, which funds the Alamance County Sheriff's Office, and propose changes to the sales tax. Newly elected Commissioner Pamela Thompson thanked those who voted for her and asks for support from those who didn't. Everybody's got their own style, they've got their own belief systems, and I think that needs to be respected because it's just not the six of us. We're the whole county, and we have to be that voice. And, um, and the, when, you, when you win, you don't work for yourself. You have a great big group of people that you work for. Following the tension at the march to the polls and the push to the polls in Graham last week, she says those involved should work to find common ground. But there's not much she herself can do. I can't fix Graham. I can't fix Elon. I can't fix Greensboro. I can just be a better example that everybody will want to fix it themselves. John Paisley Jr. and Bill Lashley also won seats on the Board of Commissioners. For continuing coverage of their win, visit our website, elonnewsnetwork.com. Coming up, our political panel is on standby with reactions to the new president-elect and with their thoughts on the future of both political parties. Plus, why the coronavirus has some students packing their bags and heading home this week. You're watching Elon Local News. We're back right after this. As both parties look to the future tonight, there are still questions for both Democrats and Republicans. Joining us now with reaction and insight is President of Elon College Democrats Alexis Malagudi and President of College Republicans Daniel Drosiak. Thank you both for joining us. Daniel, we're going to start with you tonight. Do you think that President Donald Trump should concede or will concede? I think that it's incredibly important in order for our American Republic and the American project that our founding fathers created that the president concedes power if he loses the election. So yes, I think if, he do, if the projections are correct, he should concede the race. And Alexis, how should President-elect Biden navigate the transition period if President Trump does not concede? Um, I think Biden should continue on with um, acknowledging that he won the race. I'm not sure that there's much that he can do to make President Trump concede, but just moving forward as if he won the race because he did, um, there's no indication that there was any election fraud. And for both of you, what is the future of your respective parties following the results of this election? Elect um, I think the future for the Democratic Party, or what I would like to see as the future of the Democratic Party, is em embracing progressives a little bit more. I think um, to, it was either today or yesterday John Kasich was um, saying that progressives um, were almost cost um, Biden the race and that it was thanks to Republicans um, that Biden won the race, but I think that's incorrect. We saw Republicans increase turnout for um, Trump from 90% in 2016 to 93% this um, election cycle. Um, and then AOC retorted back that we have to continue to look to progressives moving forward. Um, but I do have concern about um, the way that the Democrat Party is going, Democratic Party is going to move um, as we move forward. Yeah, and so in regards to the Republican Party, I think that the, um, the larger non-white voter turnout that we had, uh, the largest in Republican history, about 28% of our votes were of non-white voters this year. Um, I think what we need to do is really kind of keep that tent as big as it is and kind of keep as many of those non-white voters in line with the Republican Party uh, as best as we can. Um, I also think that what we need to do is continue to focus on uh, state races 
like we are doing right now uh, in North Carolina especially. Um, and I also think that what we need to do is potentially soul search because I personally believe that uh, Trump has brought some very interesting uh, opinions about the Republican Party to America and I think that uh, the Republican Party really needs to do some soul searching on what the future is going to look like for them. And what do you think Biden's um, projected win means for our campus community and the surrounding community? Daniel, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, so for the campus community, I think uh, what I've realized is that there's a lot of excitement around uh, campus. Um, a lot of people are kind of breathing a sigh of relief that Biden won. Um, I think that a lot of college students who are very vocal about their political beliefs are excited that Biden won. And I think that it's going to usher in um, just an era of calm and it might even ease the political tension and the political divide between college Democrats and college Republicans on campus. Um, in regards to the community though, uh, that's where I'm most nervous. Uh, obviously, Alamance County went red, uh, pretty red. Uh, we, we Republicans swept the county commissioner race pretty easily um, from, what I, from what I gathered. I'm more nervous of how they're going to accept it, uh, and I think that it might potentially cause some backlash and we might see potential violence uh, as a result. And I obviously don't want that violence to, ha uh, to happen. I, I think we need to sit down and really just talk with everybody and just try and really bridge the divide. Um, in terms of campus, I would agree with um, Daniel that there's been a lot of excitement. My concern is that political engagement will go down and political activism will go down because we have a um, Democrat in off or a Democrat about to be in office. Um, so that does worry me a little bit. Um, and for just for the future of college Democrats as a club, I hope people continue to be engaged. And then in terms of Alamance County, I also agree with Daniel. Um, I'm concerned about potential violence. At, as a response to Joe Biden um, winning, just because we did have the convoy earlier this semester, that is always something that's looming in the back of my mind um, when the next one is going to happen. And I was worried about that um, if Trump won as well. Great, well, thank you both for joining us tonight. We appreciate your insight. Starting today, Pandora's Pies is now open for indoor seating for the first time since the coronavirus pandemic. Previously, the restaurant was only open for takeout. Owner of Pandora's Pies, Peter Eustache, says he waited for more information about indoor transmission of the virus before opening indoor seating. He says although it is too early to tell what the impact will be on business, he hopes it gives them a little bit of a boost. Colder weather is coming. It's inevitable. Um, Come January, February, March, uh, it's not going to be very comfortable to eat it down outside. Uh, so what we really want to do is get a uh, game plan and get more comfortable with uh, providing dine-in for those, that time period because we don't see this going anywhere anytime soon. Eustache says the typical occupancy inside is 120 and is now reduced to about 50. He says all high contact services will get cleaned every 30 minutes with mask wearing enforced when not seated. Coronavirus numbers here at Elon University are continuing to fall with the school reporting four new cases today. Now there's an estimated 58 active cases and 290 people in quarantine. Alamance County reported 34 new cases today with the state reporting over 1500 new cases. For the latest numbers all the time, visit our website elonnewsnetwork.com slash coronavirus. The last day of classes this fall semester at Elon is exactly two weeks away. But to avoid getting stuck on campus or bringing the coronavirus home to loved ones, some Elon students are already packing up and going home. I spoke to some about how the break cutting so close to Thanksgiving is affecting them. Elon freshman Maya Drabzik was planning on driving home to West Virginia last Friday to quarantine before Thanksgiving, since her mom has underlying health conditions. But after her roommate tested positive for the coronavirus, her route changed course. I like like being with people. I'm not very good at being alone. So the thought of doing yeah. that for two weeks, just like for both of us, we were like, and we had already been exposed to each other. Drabzik and her sweet mate Maddie Roderman decided instead to leave campus together and quarantine in Roderman's garage loft in Connecticut. Roderman says she was disappointed to leave early, but didn't want to end up away from home over Thanksgiving. Even if we were to get out, 
like there's no everyone's gonna be leaving by the time we get out Mm -hmm. and I'd just be like missing out and like I'm still missing out but like it's different because like we're at I'm at home. Back on campus, Elon freshman Caroline Lumby is self-quarantining in her dorm, preparing to go home to Durham after hopefully testing negative for the virus. Lumby says she also decided to leave early to quarantine so her family could spend Thanksgiving with her grandmother who has lung cancer. I really love it on campus and I don't want to leave, but ultimately it's more important to spend time with my family than it is to spend two extra weeks living in a dorm. All three girls say their professors have been understanding about the situation, but Drapsic is the only one who officially transitioned to remote learning through the school. And while she's having to wait longer than expected, Drapsic says making it home for the holidays healthy will make it all worth it. I feel like right now we're not really having like the normal Elon experience, which really stinks. So like I was I guess I was like more I've been more homesick because I'm not like having the bet like as good as t- of the time as we normally would. Drabzik and Roterman say they're not alone. They say they know multiple other freshmen who are also leaving campus to go home early and quarantine as well. According to Elon's Ready and Resilient website, students are expected to remain on campus until the last day of in-person classes. However, it also says, quote, we understand there may be circumstances in which a student may choose to apply to study remotely for the remainder of the term for safety reasons. And then goes on to say students who apply for remote learning must plan to return home and cannot return to campus until January. As of today, Elon students returning to states including Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, New Jersey, and Massachusetts are asked to quarantine for 14 days of arrival. This is also the end of the first semester for the freshman class. Of course, the semester was not a traditional one with obstacles that no other freshman class has experienced, including a pandemic, a tense political season, and a non-traditional setup of the semester. Elon freshman Catherine Sloan and Devin Gilbo say that meeting people has kept them sane during the first few months on campus, but that the process and some classmates' behavior is tough. Just like living in an institutional setting during COVID has been an experience and that it was, it's not easy. It's gotten better, and I try to be outside as much as I can. Kids will unfortunately be kids, no matter if they're uh, middle school or college students. You know, if they take those freedoms as far as they can possibly go and without really thinking of the consequences. Faculty Director of the Historic Neighborhood, William Moner, says the administration has tried to create events to help promote social engagement while also following COVID-19 guidelines. I think the first years have a lot to look forward to, and so they should move forward with optimism in terms of their experience and uh, to value whatever experience they have right now because it's, it's definitely unique to them. Sloan and Gilbo both say they hope to have more opportunities to get involved on campus next semester. Brian, you know, I feel like I say this every week. Is it a shorts weather day <laughs> or not shorts weather today? And today was beautiful. It was it was shorts. It was I, definitely I shorts. shorts today, 100 percent. Yeah, and with more on our Phoenix five day forecast to see if this weather will continue, our Isabella Gouvea is live on Citrone Plaza with the answers. Isabel. Thank you, Brian and Maeve, and good evening, everyone. If you happen to walk through the town of Elon today, you might have seen the holiday wreaths have been put up around campus. It is the holiday season coming up. However, ironically enough, it is 75 degrees still. So expect cloudy skies and warm temperatures into this evening and into early in the morning tomorrow. Moving on to the Phoenix five day forecast, expect partly cloudy skies that will form tomorrow and move into thunderstorms and rain later this week. Daily temperatures should remain slightly steady, staying in the high 70s and ending in the high 60s later on. Cooler nightly temperatures will appear into the weekend with lows moving into the high 40s. Make sure you grab those umbrellas and stay dry. It is going to be a rainy one. My name is Isabel Gouveia reporting to you live from Citroen Plaza. And thank you. Back to you in the studio. Isabel, thank you. And speaking of those holiday wreaths, the Festival of Lights has been rescheduled for Tuesday, November 17th due to possible weather concerns. It was originally scheduled for this Thursday. The festival will take place at seven different locations throughout historic neighborhood to maintain social distancing guidelines. The event will end with the lighting of trees near Alamance and Young Commons ahead of the holidays. 
And still to come tonight, a community in the sky. Jack Haley brings us the fresh air we need after this weekend. You're watching Elon Local News. With such a busy week last week in the U.S., many found themselves looking for ways to get some fresh air. Our Jack Haley did just that in Salisbury to find a community in the clouds. Though it may not look like much, this field is a finish line for a three-mile race. From over 15,000 feet in the air, thrill seekers soar into one of the 350 drop zones in the United States here at Piedmont Skydiving. For Jeremy Morgan, skydiving helped break up the monotony of his life on the road. Now working as a cross-country truck driver, Morgan must make one jump a month to ensure his advanced freefall license does not expire. This license allows him to jump on his own. I, I've always been an adrenaline junkie my entire life. I mean, something crazy, something stupid to do, I'm going to try it. Beyond adding adventure to his life, Morgan's hobby also returns him to the skies. A former paratrooper himself, Morgan is no stranger to freefall. Well, this is a whole lot more fun. I mean, number one, you're up in the, you're free falling number one for up to a minute, maybe a little bit more versus four seconds. I mean, there, there's a massive difference. Steve Huffman traveled all the way from Kansas City, Missouri to jump with his friend who soars full time at Piedmont Skydiving. What really draws people is the, the people. It's more like a community. So all the people kind of have that same idea. Like, this is, this is something cool that we all do. After talking with Huffman, it was finally my turn. I was harnessed up by my tandem jump partner, a 15-minute ride into the sky, a smile to hide my terror, and away we went. After spending the afternoon with the high-flying community, I touched down relief, but filled with the same adrenaline that this group seeks every day. Jack Haley, Elon, Local News. <laughs> My stomach just turned watching Jack, you know, get the gear on and jump out of the plane. I don't know how he did that. Well, that's, yeah, I am really afraid of heights. That was, I mean, I'm laughing because good for him and he looks so happy, but oh my. Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, oh goodness. Well, looks like we won't be doing that anytime soon. That's all the news we have for you this Monday evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay up to date on our website, elonnewsnetwork.com and on social media at Elon News Network.